Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari and this is Great Big History Podcast. We continue our 10 question series, though this one's going to be a little longer. It's going to be like 13 questions because we're doing Disneyland, Disney World, Epcot, and America, 1945 to 1985. So our first question, explain America after World War II. Well, America had won. The United States had won. So America was wealthy from the war industries and the post-war boom. You have to remember, Europe and Asia were completely devastated. The United States made 60% of the world's goods. So if you had survived the war and you worked in an American factory making goods... You did well. You were doing very well because Americans now had money to buy stuff. So if you made stuff for Americans, you were good, unlike the Great Depression, unlike the 1930s. And if you made things for export to help rebuild, like steel, iron, railroad tracks, concrete, things that would help rebuild, destroy things... Or if you were a farmer, you did great. Because the United States was helping to rebuild Japan, China, the Philippines, Europe, North Africa. And so American goods were going everywhere. America was healthy. New Deal social programs, vaccines, new medicines. The most important is the antibiotics and penicillin. Americans were living longer. When my grandmother was born in 1919, uh, when she was born in 1919, she could have expected to live to about 40 to 45 years of age. That's what she expected. That's when when she was born, the adults around the room said, oh, sh she will see 1955. And that will be amazing. Right? 1965. She won't get to 1975. But, you know, that was the, that was the averages. My grandmother lived to be 90 years of age. And the average age for women had gone from 45 to 85 of life expectancy. That's vaccines. That's the new medicine. That's the new investments in health. Later on, we'll get Medicare. And so America was living longer. It was healthier and it was younger. There was a baby boom. And there's really no other way of talking about it. People who had put off having babies in the 30s because of the Great Depression and the 40s during the war were having babies. And they added 50% to the population. That number blows my mind. So there's 100 million people and 50 million babies were born. Like, think about how young America got between 1945 and 1960. Though the baby boom technically goes from like 1947-48 to 1964. But children became the largest consumer class. There were babies everywhere and you needed an economy to not sell stuff to old people, not sell stuff to businesses, not sell stuff for export. You needed to sell stuff to boomers as they went from children to teens to adults. So you needed diapers. And you needed play pens. And you needed playgrounds. And you needed housing. Where are you going to put all these kids? And then when they become teens, they need entertainment. Books. Comics. It's not a surprise that the 60s is the high time of both DC and Marvel. You get movies. Music, right? Classic rock stations are still the 1960s music. 1962 through 1978. 
you know. And then there's the adults, as they became adults and became the me generation of the 80s. There was less taxes. More Margaritaville housing. Now that, and then as adults, as retirees, now there's mass. I have seen if you have lived in Cherry Hill, in Hannonfield, on, on Route 70, you have seen Route 70 change from a place that had lots of places that sold stuff to now a lot of medical facilities. A Sims clothing retailer is now a University of Pennsylvania medical center with a three, four story garage. That's always full. The amount of um, emergency step in, walk in doctor stuff. You know, whether it's Cooper or patient first, Route 70 has completely changed. They built a whole new hospital where, in, on one of the Subaru facilities. There's a whole new hospital on Route 70, right near Collingswood, um, Cherry Hill border. So, boomers were so big, and you could see it on the graph if you're on the video, that the population, the, the amount of babies people were having were were going down. The average had go, gone below 2.1. Now this is 21, but it's two think of it as 2.1 children because it's in 21 children per thousand births or something like that. I don't know what the scale is, but you just had to move the decimal over. You need 2.1 children to just stay at the same level of population. The reason why is not everybody gets married, not everybody has children, and some people unfortunately pass away before they can have children. And so, or they pass away as children. And so you need to have more than two. Because remember, men don't make babies. So every woman needs to have two babies just to keep the population even. And so we see even by the First World War in the 1920s, that amount of population per children per woman in America was declining below replacement levels. Well, suddenly by 1950, it is erupting. It goes up to 2.7 children. So you're adding population. And this is overwhelmingly white children because white folk made up the majority of the population so the boomers are young they're white they're wealthier they're healthier they expect to live a long time and the economy is going to completely change to help their needs to fulfill their needs there's money to be made in selling stuff to boomers because there's so many of them Now, we're down to, you know, on this chart, down to 1.4. Korea right now is down to 0.78. They're, they're below this chart. So the average woman isn't even having one child in Korea. So we're going to talk about this later because um, I've got theories about the world and why there's so much authoritarianism that deal with this chart because the people who used to be in charge are not only not going to be in charge, they're disappearing. There's going to be less of them. The populations of Europe of the United States or white people in the United States and African-American people in the United States, um, China, Japan, Korea, the people who were in charge in 1900 and growing you know, the social Darwinism we talked about, they're now starting to disappear because mostly because of female education. It's mostly because women are now getting an education, getting, uh, being involved in the economy. They're working, they're starting businesses, they're making money. So they're getting married later and they're having less children. So America from 1945 to 1965, 
It had conflict abroad, the Korean War in the 1950s, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 1960s. Both were major conflicts of communism. Now, the Cuban Missile Crisis is an almost conflict, but it was also almost nuclear uh, apocalypse. So the Korean War was a, was, a, was a war where we fought both the North Koreans with Russian weapons, Soviet weapons, but also an invasion of China, by China in North Korea, just when the United States seemed posed, poised to reunify Korea and smush it back together and make it a Western democracy. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the United States and the Soviet Union almost coming into nuclear conflict. So there's, there's war abroad. There's also conflict at home. Civil rights, especially for African Americans, were roiling the cities. Different peoples were demanding different rights. And this was conflict. The, the country was changing. Women were trying to enter the workforce. And um, Betty Friedan writes her, her book on the, the problem that has no name, the feminist mystique. But at the same time, those problems seem to be solved or getting solved or working towards solutions. Korea would end in stability. It would, the, the line, the DMZ would be created. North Korea would become a Chinese satellite, which to be fair, it had been for the last roughly thousand years. South Korea, though, was a American satellite. Japan would be rebuilt. South Korea would enter into, um, it would stay as a, as a kind of for 30 years as a militarized uh, dictatorship. But by the late 80s, it would start to open up and become part of the Western Trading Alliance. And boom, now I own a South Korean car, right? My Refrigerator is Samsung from South Korea. Many of you have Samsung phone or LG phones. Like the, some of the biggest bands in the world are Korean pop bands. So the, the Korean War would be solved. You know, it's still a conflict. It's still a problem. There is technically no peace between South and North Korea, but we have a stability. The Cuban crisis has a stalemate, but we had no war. It was solved. Civil rights, we got desegregation of the South. It wasn't pretty. But George Wallace got on the steps and said, segregation now, segregation in the future, segregation forever. And that's just not what happened. Go to, go to Atlanta. You know, the South is more or less desegregated. In fact, there's an argument to be made that the South is less segregated than the North is. There's the Civil Rights Act. There's the Voting Rights Act, both in the mid-1960s, so that the United States, by 1968, the 1968 presidential election, can really say that it is a multi-ethnic democracy for the first time in its history that all citizens could vote. And whether and then the, the 26th Amendment, I think it is, brought in younger people, people under the age of 21, because the average age of um, men who served in Vietnam was 19, but you had to be 21 to vote in federal elections. Well, that's a problem. And so what you end up with is, a, is an amendment that allows 18 to 21 to vote. Great. So we get more democracy, civil rights. Korea and is solved. The um, Cold War is kind of not solved, not fixed, not finalized, but there's a stalemate and there's no war. And that's kind of what's going to happen from 1962 to 1989 is the idea that the United States and the Soviet Union are at war, in a cold war, but they're not going to shoot each other. They're not going to have a nuclear war. So you could start to breathe easier. 
We have the GI Bill for men returning from the Second World War. And what that guaranteed was home ownership, a new wealth, new houses. In fact, it privileged new houses over old houses. It wanted to get people out of the cities. It wanted to, to put people in new houses up out in the suburbs. And that's, those new houses are worth something, are worth more than the declining homes in the cities, than the declining apartments. These are going to be, you know, three bedrooms, one bedroom, one massive bedroom for the parents. And then remember, you have a lot of children, so there's got to be two bedrooms for the kids, right? One for the girls, one for the boys, right? You're going to have a garage. You're going to have a backyard. It creates the suburbs. Now, I'm from, from New York, and I live 20 minutes away from Levittown. There's a Levittown here in, outside of Philly. They just built massive amounts of homes, just like they built ships during the Second World War. And so you built the suburbs, and they're all built on streets. They're all built with the car in mind, all the shopping. You can't walk to any of the shopping. You have to drive, and you have to commute on the highways, these new highways, to the local city where the job is. But the GI Bill also segregated who can live where because the GI Bill is in the 1940s. So Southern segregation reigned supreme. So the idea was you can get, you could give money to everybody, but you can't mix the people. And so you get Levittown for white folk, but Roosevelt for black folk. And in fact, if you were an African-American, you, you walked in and said, I'd like to buy a home. The Levitts would not tell you. Real estate agents would not even show you homes if you were an African-American in Levittown, in one, of the black, in one of the white neighborhoods, white suburbs. They took you, oh, we have wonderful places in Roosevelt, in other places where it was mostly African-Americans. You also got free college education, a perk still part of the of the uh, joining up for the military. And the idea was you'll stay out of the economy for four years because the worry was if 20 million men come back from the military, they'll flood the economy and you'll have a lot of people unemployed. We saw this in World War One. We see this in most wars. We see this in your, if you were in my one-on-one class, we especially talk about this after the Punic Wars. We talk about this in the, the last hundred years of the Roman Republic. So the idea was take four years off. Don't work. Go to college. Increase your skills. And when you come out in four years, you'll get a better job for more money with your better skills. So you'll move up. And that's exactly what happened. And in fact, that is the last Willie Gillis painting that Norman Rockwell does. If you're looking at the video, it's the middle painting. Willie Gillis has something like 11 paintings done. It's a character. Uh, it's the typical World War II young man soldier. And there's like 11 covers for the Saturday Evening Post that, that Rockwell does. And the last one he does is the one you see here. It's Willie Gillis, his helmet hanging from the ceiling, and he's got a pipe, and he's a co-ed. He's sitting in a window, clearly in New England somewhere, and he's studying his philosophy. He's studying his chemistry. He's got his golf bag, so he does sport as well. He's not in the military anymore. He has had these life experiences, and now he is getting a college education. And that is the last Willie Gillis painting. So the idea for, for Rockwell was this horror of the Second World War ends with a content young man in college with a bright future ahead of him. Of course it's bright. He's getting a college education. 2%, 3% of Americans got a college education before the GI Bill. And if you didn't want to go to a 
to a four-year college, you can get job training. And that's millions of men would go into job training. So they could move up. So instead of being um, an entry-level plumber, they could become a master plumber. They could move up the job market. So you have U.S. wealth. Median income tripled from 1945 to 1965 in one generation. Median income tripled in 20 years. Why does that matter? Well, we're going to see later that Americans, middle-class Americans, have not gotten a pay raise since 1973. That once you adjust for inflation, the amount of money Americans make now, today, is about equal to what they made in 1973. In fact, the minimum wage, which is seven, eight bucks an hour, the federal minimum wage, is one third what it was in the 1960s in terms of value. And so from 1945 to 1965, life was good and it was getting better. It's Mad Men. He's in his white, white shirt with his convertible out in California, his skinny black tie, his sunglasses, Ray-Ban sunglasses on. It's John Hamm having a great time driving down the Pacific Coast Highway, driving down the bridge down to Key West to do some fishing like Hemingway. Life was good and it was getting better. So explain the emotion post-World War II. It was optimism. The idea, and you hear this if you ever go to Disneyland or Disney World, if we can dream it, we can do it. Now that comes from Horizons, a, a ride in Epcot in, 19, in the 1980s. It does not come from Walt Disney. It's kind of attributed, if not officially, like lots of people, will, oh, if we could dream it, we can do it. They'll, they think of it as Walt Disney. But that's the idea. He... The U.S. had won the war, so it had power and it had money. It had built the bomb, so it was the leading scientific country in the world. It had punished the fascists at Nuremberg and the Tokyo trials, so it was the leading human rights country in the world. And okay, yeah, civil rights were a problem in the United States, but getting better. Remember, we have desegregation of the schools. We have the federal government supporting desegregation in the South. So there's the idea of, that the United States is way ahead of Europe, much less the Soviet Union, the communist world, on human rights. The idea was the U.S. could do anything. It could even turn a giant orange grove into the happiest place on earth, right on the edge of Los Angeles, right in the middle of a small city called Anaheim. So what did Disneyland represent? It represented an aspirational middle class and wholesome entertainment. It was expensive. It was always expensive. People who complain that Disneyland or Disney World is too expensive, well, it's always been that way because it's supposed to be aspirational. You're supposed to save up for it, for the experience you want. But it was supposed to be an always supposed to be attainable. And there are charts going back to the 1950s, the idea that, that you know, the average person would save for two years. You know, they used to have clubs in banks where you could put your money away, every paycheck, right? Or, or every month they would withdraw. It would be an automatic withdrawal of $20, $50 over, you know, 12 months or 24 months. And then by the end, you turn around and, oh, there's $5,000. That's a vacation. You know, and it would earn 2, 3, 4% interest. You know, because they lived in, a, in an age when banks paid interest. It was supposed to be attainable for middle and working class families. Poor folk were never supposed to go to Disney World. That's what made Disneyland and Disney World different than amusement parks or the county fair. 
They weren't there for the carnies. They weren't there for the hobos. They were there for hardworking, middle and working class Americans. Rich people could go, but rich people had other options too. Whether it was national parks and skiing at Aspen or cruise to Hawaii, rich people had also other entertainment options. They could go and they could afford it, but it was supposed to be attainable. And so when people complain today that Disney World is too expensive, it's the idea that I can't obtain it. Even if I save, the costs are going up faster than I can save. And so it becomes a rite of passage for middle-class kids. I can remember being in elementary school when kids started to go to Disney World and they come back and they'd be like, oh my God, it rained every day in Florida. Florida was like this crazy, magical place where it rained every day and you're like, rain, but it's like now that I've gone to Florida, now that my parents have like a retirement home, have a, 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 you know, it's not retirement, but they have a place down there. It does rain. It rains for about 20 minutes and then it's done. <laughs> and then the sun comes out and it gets humid again. But to a kid in New York, when it's, you say it rained every day, it's like, oh, it started at 8 a.m. and it never stopped raining. It's like a monsoon. But it was a rite of passage. These kids would come back and be like, oh my God, I went on Space Mountain. You know, you proved your masculinity by going on Space Mountain, the, the, the wildest roller coaster around but it was a safe place for children and adults to enjoy and to enjoy child's entertainment children's entertainment this is not the depression anymore adults could go there and and enjoy and have fun partake that was the whole point of it that they didn't have to be so serious they didn't have to be well, I fought in the war. I survived the depression. Urgh, I'm never going to tell my children I love them. You could go to Disney World. Disneyland, excuse me. And ride the teacups. And laugh. And take a picture with Minnie. And have ice cream in the shape of M Mickey's head. You could have what they used to call a gay time. Now remember, these are people who lived, some of them lived through the First World War. They certainly fought in the Second World War. They lived through the Depression. These are not people with senses of humor. These are not people overflowing with love and affection for their children. They're just, I mean, I know I'm painting with a broad bar brush, but you know, but there's plenty of movies from the 60s, 70s, 80s. There's plenty of books by boomers. There's Mary Poppins of all things about how miserable their, their parents have been. But of course their parents were miserable. They had survived the First World War, the Great Depression, and the Second World War. They were traumatized, and there was no, no therapy for that. But the idea was Disneyland was kind of that therapy. This is not the Depression. You can go there, and it was a safe space to engage in fun. It wasn't work. It wasn't business. It was stupid. Everybody knew it. And since everybody knew it and you were paying a lot of money for it, it was okay to actually enjoy it. What about Main Street USA? So when you walk into Disneyland, this is Disneyland, 1955. It's the introduction to Disneyland. You walk into it and a lot is to be made of, it's like a movie where you have the opening credits and they're on the windows. Well, it's also safe shopping. It's commercialism. It's capitalism. It's an entire street of things to buy, to spend money on, but it's safe. There's no pickpockets. There's no hobos. There's no bums. There's no begging. No one's trying to steal from you. 
I've been to Disneyland and Disney World many times. I've seen people leave five hundred dollar, you know, children push carts with all of their day's stuff, and they just leave it there and they walk off. And you're like, how? You would never do this at a Walmart. And so it's a safe space for commercialism, for capitalism, for shopping. It's also nostalgia for America that was this small Midwestern town. Now, that town never existed. Like Main Street USA is, an, is a platonic ideal in some ways of an America that was. You have the horse and buggy, but no poo. You have shopping, but no pickpockets. You have a town, but no bums, no drunks. But it reflects an America that never was. It's all commerce. There's no church, no school, no library. There's no heavy trades, no pollution trades like Smith's. There's horse and buggies, but there's no one to make horseshoes. No leather goods. Now there's shops that sell leather goods, but you don't have the tanning. Why? Because it's smelly. It's gross to render down the fat, to strip the leather off the hides. It's bloody work. Smithing is all pollution. It's the nature of being a smith. Lots of heat, lots of hammers, lots of waste. Whether it's the charcoal from the, from the furnace, the impurities, the metal impurities that are being hammered out. So there's no heavy trades. There's no polluting trades. That's not a, mid, that's not a town in 1900. That has none of those things. And so it reflects this idea of a town, a Midwestern town, that America was, but it never was. So right from the beginning, you're introduced to a nostalgia for a feeling. I don't want to say it's a lie, because it's not a lie. It's a feeling. And the reason I don't want to say it's a lie is because this is the same feeling, the emotion they're going for, the idea of what used to be that Hallmark Christmas movies go for, that, that the much of the best conservative um, art goes for. They try, it's not reflecting reality. It's reflecting the feeling for what used to be. There's a frontier land. Why? Because the idea of the adventure, that America has had this frontier, and that was where you went, where men became men. The Wild West, where there were no rules, and men could just impose themselves on nature. It was them and their gun, right? The, the show paladin, you know? He goes marching. Da, 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 da. The TV show paladin. It's going to be Davy Crockett from Disney in 1955. Where everyone's going to, all the kids wore coonskin raccoon hats, right? It's the idea that you can impose yourself on the West, it's where Americans became men. Well, there's no dysentery. There's no Native Americans. There's no war. The settlement and conquest of the West is all war. Hundreds of years, manifest destiny is constant warfare, whether against Native Americans, the British, Spain, Mexico, the French. It's constant conflict. So none of that is part of it. Again, this idea of the adventure without any of the negatives. You get to ride in a rail car, take a stagecoach, go on a paddle boat. But then there are clean bathrooms, freshly cooked burgers, and ice-cold Coca-Colas. Yeah, you can 
pretend you could do the wild west and then take a step to the left and have a modern and safe life without any of the hardship, without any of the prejudice, without any of the conflict. You could avoid all the history, all the experience of the wild west and you get the feeling of the excitement. Fantasy land. Oh, this is where childhood can be fun, carefree, and innocent. And this is an invention. This is new because that wasn't childhood before, unless you were the like ultra rich. Childhood was not fun, carefree, and innocent. We have Hemingway to tell us that. We have F. Scott Fitzgerald. These are fairly well off people who have miserable childhoods that they, they have to work out in their novels. Children were little adults who were getting ready to work. And life was struggle. In fact, we talked about industrialization in which little kids, five, five, six, eight-year-olds, went to work in, in heavy industries with adults. Fantasyland, though, is the idea that childhood is fun. It's carefree. It's innocent. And that's new. That's a new invention of the post War, war world that the boomers were the first generation to have a fun childhood that childhood wasn't preparing for war that the idea that children should live separate from the experiences of adult and so it should be fun it should be careful it should be all games like puppies Children shouldn't be getting ready for the war of adulthood, of business, of commerce, of capitalism, of growing up. No, 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 no. They should be playing tag. Pretending to um, be teacher at school. Uh, pretending with their easy bake ovens to make food. And that's embedded in fantasy land. The idea that parents can be kids with their children as well. This is Disney's Walt Disney's carousel story of the idea of where Disney World would come from. Now, it's, it's an apocryphal story, but he told it. And it's like he went to an amusement park. His daughters rode the merry-go-round. They rode the carousel. And he's like, you know, there should be a place where I can ride rides with the kids. I'm here on this park bench. The girls are having fun, and I'm not a part of it. And I should be a part of it. Parents should be part of that. And that is embedded in fantasy land. You can live in the stories and live in the movies. You can meet princesses, fly with Peter Pan, go under the sea with Captain Nemo. That's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Jules Verne's fantasy story. Now, by making this okay, you now get a new post-war definition of masculinity and a new post-war definition of adult behavior. Real men rode rides with their sons and their daughters. That's insane. That is crazy. That's not what Teddy Roosevelt would have told you a man was in 1900. That's definitely not what a man was in 1500. Right? Sitting there having ice cream cones, Buying trickets, wearing goofy ears, a real man, a man who had defeated the Nazis was going to wear goofy ears. That's insane. That's just crazy talk. Because nobody, I've seen Private Saving Private Ryan, at no point do any of these men sit down and have a conversation where they're like, one day I am going to play catch with my kids. We're going to laugh. And I am going to wear a silly hat. And they're going to say, Daddy, Daddy, wear the silly hat. And I will wear the silly hat. And we will all laugh. And I will tell my kids, I love them so much. And they'll say, I love you, Daddy. And we'll never have to go to work ever again. That's what we're fighting for, guys. We're fighting for a place where children and men can play and have fun and games. And dads will love their kids. And everything will be great. That's there is no conversation in that. None. In It's a Wonderful Life, there's no conversation like that. I mean, 
George loves his kids. It's not that he doesn't. He kisses his daughter at the end. Right? He loves his daughter. But at the same time, he also, like, for for most of the movie, wishes that she didn't exist. Wishes he didn't exist. He hates his life because it's all boxed in. He had all this potential. If you read The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, same thing. You watch Mad Men. John Hamm's character in Mad Men, Don Draper, has 19 affairs. 19. 19. And they go to Disneyland. He takes his kids to Disneyland. With his girlfriend, who's also his secretary. Like, it's crazy. But that's the idea. That you could wear goofy ears and be a real man. That what happens at Disneyland is okay at Disneyland. Can you wear your goofy hat at home on the weekends when you're listening to the bowl game? No. No, 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 no. A lot of what you buy at Disneyland cannot be used any other time. But what happens at Disneyland is okay at Disneyland. What about Tomorrowland? This is even a Tomorrowland. It has a view. Disneyland has a view of the future. And what is that view of the future? It is white clean and bright now not white as in people though most of the people going to disneyland because of it's it's expensive are white folk or middle class or above white folk but it's all the color white meaning cleanliness there's not the pollution there's not the grime of the cities it's it's clean like a like an intel semiconductor lab where everyone's in the white coats and everything's just white. It, you know? I think of the the episode of Monk where the character can't stand the smell from a garbage, um, from a, a garbage strike and he can't think and he, there's a murder and he's got to solve it but he can't think because there's all this, dis- it's just disgusting. The city is just gross. And so what the police chief does is take him into a semiconductor fabrication lab and he's like, this has its own air supply. There's no germs. There's no outside air. It is the purest place on earth. And everybody's in white and all the room is in white. There's no color. There's space, there's fast travel, there's new technologies. There's actually a house of tomorrow in Tomorrowland. The idea was tomorrow was going to be better than today. You couldn't say that in 1925. You definitely couldn't say it in 1935. You know, in 1945, oh, you were hoping. You were hoping that after 100 million people dead in two nuclear explosions that tomorrow would be better because it couldn't get much worse. As what was revealed that the, the that was happening in China, what was happening in Eastern Europe is revealed. It's like, oh my God, it's even worse than we thought it was. And what's the message for Tomorrowland? Capitalism is good for America. Everything had a corporate sponsor of new, new technologies. In fact, in our picture, right? General Dynamics. General Dynamics, the aircraft company. The, the, the defense company is a sponsor with a giant sign of the Astro Orbiter of a bunch of, you get to fly in a, your own little spaceship woo, in a circle, right? You get to fly. Unions were good for workers and businesses. Businesses made money from the middle class workers. This is famously a period where the the head of GM, General Motors, said, what's good for America is good for General Motors, and what's good for General Motors is good for America. And so there's this idea that everybody working together, unions were good for workers, they're also good for business, everybody's, you you want peace, not war, internationally or, or in your company, that everybody could just agree to work together. And that doesn't mean it was without conflict, but it wasn't violent conflict. 
So you have peace, not war. And that's the future. You could see that the future in Tomorrowland is, is there's no war in the future. None. None. This spaceship Earth, this giant mountain with a roller coaster inside of it, you can't even see the roller coaster. That's crazy. They built a roller coaster and then they covered it with a mountain. And then they lit it up and it's cool. So what happened to America after 1965? Well, Walt Disney died in 1966. And that was a trauma for the Disney Corporation. In fact, the kind of next two decades are basically being trapped in the past of this idea of what would Walt do? What would Walt do? That nobody could pick up his mantle. Nobody had the legitimacy to step in. It's going to be run by members of the Disney family. But the older generation, Walt's generation was getting old. And the newer generation just was different. They were raised in prosperity. And so there's this being trapped in the past. What, what to do? And then America is changing. So not only did the Disney Corporation have to change and deal with its own trauma and its own kind of st stuckness. America was going through that in the late 60s and the 70s as well. There was white flight. White people started leaving urban cities. There was resegregation of America by wealth. As people moved to different suburbs, those suburbs got differentiated by wealth. We see this on Haddon Avenue today. Collingswood, Haddon Township, Haddon Field. Those people do not go to the same colleges. Their wealth isn't the same. They're nice towns, but each one is is wealthier than the one next to it. And they live different lives. You also get deindustrialization, and with less money, less factory work, more unemployed people, you get attacks on unions. As businesses, as corporations move their factories to low cost uh, low cost countries in South America or especially into Asia, What's left behind is you can attack the unions because you could always say, well, if you don't like the deal, we'll move you. We'll move to Bangladesh. We'll move to Taiwan. We'll move to Japan. So the middle class declines in share of wealth. And that's our, our two images in our video is the middle class in 1969 had 53% of the wealth in the country. By 2013, that had declined to 45%. That's the middle 60%. Where did that wealth go? Well, that's the second image. From 1980 to 2014, the people who got the pay raise were the 99th percentile, the top 1%, and especially the top 1 10th, 100th, and 1 1,000th one of a percent were making unbelievable amounts of money because of the rise in the stock market and the change of income from a a salary to stocks and so i'm just a historian but i have a lot of like this is what changed america is when ceos started getting paid massive amounts in stock instead of in a well reimbursed salary because the incentives change. The incentives are all like you want the stock price to go up. How does the stock price go up? You need profits. How do you make profits? Well, you can enter new industries or what you could do is just fire 20,000 people, move factories to low cost countries and make the people who are left work harder work three jobs instead of having three people do each a job you have one person do three different kinds of jobs and so and now oh more profits 
stock price goes up, more people invest in the company because the profits are up. They think they're going to make more money. And so you get, as a CEO, you get the stock bump, you get the cash out, boom, you made a couple million dollars. And so um, CEOs are now making 400 times what their average employees are making. Whereas in the 1960s, it's much less than that. In fact, in from 1946 to 1980, the wealthier you got, the less actually you made in increases per year. That's our second graph, right? The poorest people were getting the biggest pay bumps. They were moving faster into the middle class and the richest were still going up. So if you had a $20 million, yours went up by 2%. But by 2014, you're now making more than 6%, three times the growth rate. Well, you can imagine how that compounds year after year after year. Americans became more isolated. They're working longer hours for less. There's more divorce. There's more unemployment. Women have to go to work, leaving kids alone. Those kids are going to be our young Xers, Gen, Gen Xers. So you get more individualized entertainment, especially video games. I grew up playing a lot of video games, so I don't get the people who are like, video games will, and I heard it ever since I was a kid, video games will melt your mind. You should be reading Greek. I'm like, whatever, dude. I still got my PhD. I'm still teaching in college, so I still wrote a book, so I'm still doing okay, even though I played a lot of video games as a kid. But the bigger problem was, I played a lot of video games alone as a kid. It was individualized entertainment. Even if I read, even if I read Greek, I would have been doing it alone. Whereas the 50s, 60s, 70s, there were more children doing more things together. The rich were wealthier. The poor were getting poorer. The Vietnam War, the racial riots, the anti-war riots, and then the oil crisis. So you have these, the war... Then you have social conflicts, and then you have an economic crisis equal to trauma on the idea of the peaceful future. That by 1969, by 1972, by Watergate in 1974, where even the president is seen as untrustworthy. Something that, I mean, we talked about Harding, right? Having all his sexcapades and Kennedy doing the same. It wasn't common knowledge. It was suspected. It was whispered, but the president was still held as an exemplary person, which is why the, the, the crises in, in the 20s and Harding's or Hoover's inability to do anything about the Great Depression hurt the entire system, and that's Nixon. Nixon's kind of the last one where people are like, yes, we trust him, and then it was, oh, we can't trust you. You use that trust against us. In fact, that's the most famous line from Nixon is people should know if their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. Turns out he was a crook and he knew he was a crook. And so just the idea that America was getting better is just, it just dies. America wasn't getting better. So you had to now scrimp. You had to save. You had to, 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 to hold on to what you had. And other people were trying to take it away from you. This is how you get white flight. With people streaming, white folks streaming out of like Queens, like the outer boroughs of New York City, and going to Long Island, going to Westchester. And then making sure like black folk can't move into their, their neighborhoods. I went to a school where there were no black people. There were three elementary schools and there were none, not at all in 1983. You could take a look at my, my uh, fifth grade photo. They're all white kids except for a couple of um, Asian kids, two of which were adopted from China or Korea out of poverty and there was one Vietnam War baby. You know, there was a child whose father uh, 
went to war and and you know fell in love with a you know a woman in in the Philippines or a nurse in the Philippines or in Vietnam and came back with a war bride you know this happened in World War II too it's you know there's an entire Keanu Reeves movie about this so but that's how you know in a class of 30 kids there's three non-white kids So, and that's multiplied over the four classes in the grade. Like, there were just no black kids. None. And that's the suburbs of the 1980s. So, how did Disney World reflect the post-70s? Now, Disney World is going to be built in Florida in the 1970s. So, Disneyland was in the middle of the Los Angeles area. I mean, it's it's right now, right down the street from the convention center in Anaheim. I mean, it is it is surprising how close to like urban life Disneyland is. It's right in the middle of this urban area. Disney World, on the other hand, is isolated. It's separated. It's alone. It is huge. It is twenty seven thousand acres. It is twenty miles from Orlando in Florida. In 1972, 1973, there is nothing there. It is hot. It is a swamp. How are you even going to get there? You're going to fly? You can't fly. Flying is way too expensive. You're going to drive from New York? That's 20 hours. It made no sense. It was away from everything. It was hard to get to. It was hot when kids weren't in school. Or it was crowded when the kids weren't in school. Orlando was not a major city. There just there was there was like two there was a campground and like two hotels when Disney World opens, one or two hotels, right? There's still the optimism. That's the impressive part. It's the 70s, and it's not feeling very good, but there's still this optimism. Walt Disney has died, and it's just like, we could, do, we could still do something. We could turn a swamp into paradise, and that's it. And one of the great stories they will tell you about Disney World is that the, this, the, first, the, the ground floor of Disney World is actually the first or second floor of Disney World, that there's actually a series of basements that they never built at Disneyland that they regretted not building, but they built a whole basement structure into Disney World. Now, that's impressive because Disney World is a swamp. There is nothing in Florida more than whatever it is, 10 feet above sea level. I mean, you dig a hole in Florida, you will hit water and an alligator. There's just, like, (laughs) there's just, it's just Florida. It's a giant swamp. So there's, there is the optimism. We can turn this swamp into paradise. There's also, it's trapped by the past. Where are the pirates? Where is the haunted mansion? In fact, that's what happens. The East Coast people who had never gone to Disneyland but had seen the, the TV shows, had seen the advertisements of the Pirates of the Caribbean, of the haunted mansion, when they go to Disney World, they're like, we're the pirates. And they're like, we don't have pirates. We wanted to be a new place with new rides. And the people went, no, 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 no. I want pirates. I have come to see the pirates of the Caribbean. I have heard about the pirates of the Caribbean ever since the 1950s. I want to see pirates. So they're trapped by the past, by people's expectation of the past. Disney world was bigger, more expensive. It was, it was this more isolated version of Disneyland. But it couldn't really be different. It's just a bigger, grander Disneyland. But going there, because it's big, because of it, because it's expensive, because it's hard to get to, becomes this sign of masculine success for this tougher age of the 70s and the 80s where things were getting harder. That's Phil Sims in 1986. Phil Sims, you just won the Super Bowl. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do next? I'm going to Disneyland, Disney World. Not Disneyland. I'm going to Disney World. And every Super Bowl MVP since 1986 has gone. Has gone. 
Patrick Mahomes was there the day after the Super Bowl. He flew from Arizona. He didn't. Disneyland is right there. Disneyland is literally a like an hour, 90 minutes tops flight away. He's in Disney World. And if a Super Bowl MVP can go to Disney World, well, you can too. It's okay. What about Epcot? Epcot has a section called Future World. So what about Epcot's Future World? Well, the boomers were older. They had families, jobs, responsibilities. By 1983, when Epcot opens, the oldest boomers were 35. They had kids of their own. They had jobs. They, had, they now had careers. They had a house. Future world was America still has it. It was still this optimism. Spaceship Earth is this giant, enormous geodesic dome. It is really a stunning work of architectural art. And there is a hidden ride inside of it, just like a roller coaster inside of of, um, Space Mountain. There is a ride inside Spaceship Earth. It is not a roller coaster. It is... Much to much to many of kids' chagrin, it is a slow um, ride through time. It's cool, but it's not a roller coaster. But there's also the problem of Spaceship Earth, which is people call it the golf ball. It looks like a golf ball. So there's, it's enormous and it's amazing, and it's also a bit not serious. You can you can go, you know. There's also this little, like, you could jab it in a way you you didn't do that with Cinderella's Castle. There was also a ride called Horizons, that the future is going to be great. And they used the family from the Carousel of Progress. The Carousel of Progress was originally a ride that Disney, Walt Disney himself, cre- helped create for the 1964 World's Fair. And it was... The idea that Americans had been through time and had changed and the technology around their houses had changed, but the American family was the core of America. The family stayed the same, even though the technology changed. Well, Horizons was the future will be that too. The future is going to be great. And this is where we get the phrase, if we can dream it, we can do it. And so there's still this idea that even in the 1980s, the future is good and America still has it, still has education, still has money, still has optimism. But also, Epcot wasn't a lot of fun. There's not a lot of rides. There were no characters. It was the education park. And especially in the earliest days, and I'm, I'm one of these kids, you go and you're like, can we go back to Dis- Can we go back to Magic? Kingdom, please. Can, can we go back to Disney World became the rides, Fantasyland. I mean, I didn't, you know, all right, there were some rides, and but did I really want to see the universe of energy in a 90-minute movie? Like, oh, we got dinosaurs for two or three minutes, and we got Exxon telling us about oil for 20 minutes. It's like, eh. And here's the other thing. Epcot was not supposed to be a theme park at all. It was supposed to be a perfectly planned city. That's what Walt Disney sold it as. Not as. That's why he bought all the land. He didn't think of Epcot as a theme park. He thought of it as a new kind of city where people would live and they would work. And so by turning it into a theme park, it showed the collapse of ambition from 1966, when Walt Disney died, to 1983, when Epcot opens. Corporations make money. They don't make dreams. And when Disney opens up its own planned town celebration in, in the 1990s, they used 1900s architecture from 1900 to 1950. It's a nostalgia for the past. It's not progress towards the new. So instead of being, we're going, Epcot was supposed to be a new kind of city. Instead, when Disney makes its own city, it's a nostalgia. It's, a, it's like Main Street USA. The other part of Epcot is the World Showcase. And the World Showcase is interesting because what it really is is a safe space for Americans to see the world. You could walk 
around the world. You can go from Canada, that's the most like kind of American, to Britain, to France, where you could start with Mexico, our southern neighbor. Notice that when you come out of future world, Notice that when you come out of future world, you can go left towards Mexico or right towards Canada. Our neighbors. Our neighbors. After that, things get a little messy in terms of like understanding who comes next. But if you go to the right, it's Canada, Britain, France. right? Then Morocco. But in 1985, only 3% of Americans had a passport. In 2017, it's 40%. That's good, but it's still less than half. This is a far way in 1985. This is no longer going to Paris on $5 a day. This is not that world where you have the handbooks, the Rick Steves of, of 1960 of you take a cruise and it costs you, you know, it's fairly cheap. You go to Paris, it's fairly cheap. You can see Bruges, you know, you take the trains. You have a, you, you're an American, right? And everybody loves you because you're an American and you help save Europe from the Nazis. Not by 1985 anymore. The world is a scarier place. There are angry Europeans over the Cold War and anti-nuclear weapons that are, the United States is storing in Europe. There are Middle Eastern terrorists blowing up planes or hijacking them at least, but also blowing them up. There's Japan, Japan Inc., buying up American companies, buying up American land. I remember being a kid watching it and, and every day what the yen was, what the pre and that was like not national news, it was local news. And today in economics, the yen was, and when it broke 100 yen per dollar, people had a meltdown. It was like the sign that America was this done. So you had Japan Inc. buying up American companies. There was a TV show called Gung Ho, right? It was a Japanese company was now going to make Jap Japanese cars in America. And it was this clash of Japanese and American culture, right? Um, so the world was a scarier place than it had been in 1960. But what Epcot's World Showcase did was have familiarity. Everyone speaks English. And the bathrooms are free because I'm sure you heard in Europe you had to pay for bathrooms. Foreigners like you. All the people there were from those countries, but they all like you. They're all nice to you. They all help serve you. You don't have to leave America to see lots of foreign places. You can see the Eiffel Tower. Look, it's in our picture. There's the Eiffel Tower right there. St. Mark's Square in Venice. A Moroccan mosque. A Shinto temple. A Norwegian staff church. Hell, you could go to Independence Hall and never have to go to Philly. And get chicken nuggets there. You could go to America in the past on World Showcase. It's the idea that don't go, stay here. That America's world had gotten smaller. That the idea, remember we, we had the song, what are you going to do? How do you keep them on the farm when they've seen Paris? That worry that they're going to leave us. They're going to go to the city that's more exciting. They're going to go to France. They're going to go to Europe because they've gone to war and they've seen a better place than Kansas. Well, it turns out by 1985... Americans were staying home. They were increasingly scared of the world. And here comes Epcot's World Showcase saying, you don't have to go. You can engage in the world right here. You could get lamb kebabs in Morocco. You could get sushi in Japan. You could have fish and chips and a, and a beer in Britain. And then buy tea, British tea. You could have tacos and tamales in Mexico. Right? You don't have to leave. You can stay. So have a good day. Be safe. Take care. See you soon.